Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today I'm talking to David Post of Temple University and the author of Jefferson's Moose, Notes on the State of Cyberspace. David, thanks for coming. Thank you. What was Jefferson's Moose, and why is it so important to you that you had to name your book after? Um, uh, Jefferson's Moose was uh, a moose, the American moose that Jefferson had um, shipped to him in Paris when he was serving as the American ambassador to Paris reassembled in his, uh, en the entry uh, lobby of his residence and put on display for the Parisians to come see. Um, why it's interesting and important to me, uh, I guess uh, if I could explain that uh, quickly, I wouldn't have written the whole right. book, I suppose. Um, yeah. But uh, it, it turns out the moose was really central to, to some very interesting Jefferson uh, to plans and, and ideas and thoughts. Um, and it symbolized uh, strangeness. It, it symbolized greatness. strangeness, newness of the new world. That was part of the program was to was to show the Europeans to get them to believe in the newness of of the place. Part of it was just as science. Um, Jefferson was really interested in large animals. He was interested in the laws of nature that govern scaling in mm -hmm. the natural world, how and things get big. This is central to cyberspace, right? right. I mean, because what, ha what works on a small s scale doesn't necessarily work on a big scale. Correct. Cyberspace is as big as our imaginations, to use a cliche. To use a cliche, but I but think that's right. Knows, but, but only if it actually can scale. I right. mean, our imagination yeah. scale, we can imagine perhaps something, but it actually has to do the work. Yeah. I mean, one of the things with thinking about scale on the net is that how did it get? How did the internet get so big? Um, how did it manage the rather? How did it in in the terms of? Because one of the themes in your book, which is also a Jeffersonian theme, which is that small units are more capable of reg of self regulation right. or of of kind of creating some kind of order. Right. And now we have a global network uh, that was not really designed by anybody and is not completely ruled by anybody. Right. So. Is cyberspace working in, as it scales up? Well, I, I mean, I think it is working as it scales up. Um, I think that one of the lessons from cyberspace is, you know, I talk about it in the book, Jefferson helped figure out how to scale Republican government mm -hmm. up. Um, I think that's from one of the traditionally small exactly. units to uh, national, right? Or the idea many level. people yeah. believe that it was sort of a law that, that mm -hmm. it wasn't going to work in large communities. It couldn't work over large spaces, and Jefferson helped really destroy that idea and 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 scale from Atlantic to the Pacific. It's a remarkable achievement. And I think cyberspace governance, in a sense, the the the, the builders of the net managed to scale to a global scale the governance mechanisms that at least built the, the protocol. It's quite a remarkable story. One, one of the uh, interesting points in your story, you, uh, in your book, you talk about um, the way that laws in cyberspace or the, the capabilities of cyberspace inter, uh, intersect and interact with uh, kind of terrestrial-based government or governance. So, uh, for instance, Yahoo, yeah. uh, Yahoo uh, various auction sites on Yahoo will offer Nazi memorabilia for collectors, but right. then in certain countries, France, Germany, et cetera, this is illegal. Right. So how, how does cyberspace negotiate its, its peace treaties with terrestrial government? Well, that, uh, that, that's <coughs> the many billion, trillion dollar question. Mm -hmm. um, the conventional system, it doesn't work very well. I mean, I think that, you know, so, uh, de describing what, it, it's what I call jurisdictional whack-a-mole. You know, it's just wherever you pop up, you know, France will assert jurisdiction right. because you are sending in uh, unlawful material, and then if you pop up in some place where they can grab you, you know, boom, they're, right. they're going to get you. Um, and on a global scale with multi, with uh, uh, more complicated transactions, it just doesn't form a workable legal system. Mm -hmm. um, the peace treaty, right, there are no institutions in cyberspace really that one could appeal to for a peace treaty. Um, I think how it works actually is that courts in the real world at some points, and to some extent this, this has already happened, um, will defer in appropriate circumstances to the rules that are set in online communities. Um, I don't think that is far-fetched. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So let's say, you know, France has anti-Nazi uh, memorabilia laws. So uh, Yahoo will block Nazi stuff going to French uh, IP addresses or something. But Maybe. then what about China? Uh, because there you have a question of the government saying, we do not want uh, certain types of behavior, certain types of thoughts uh, represented. Right. Anymore. Right. No, I would, I, would, I would back you up a little bit. I mean, I, I, I don't think Yahoo has an obligation to comply with French law. 
uh, any more than it has an obligation to comply with Saudi Arabian law or Brazilian law. Um, uh, and I think a world in which we are all, the thing about the net is that we're all subject to everybody's law by that rationale. Right. And it can't be that I'm simultaneously subject to 180 countries' law. Um, the deference, I think, comes when and if there are serious self-governing communities on, on the net, which we don't really have now, I, I think it's fair to say, but which are one, one might be able to imagine into existence. And they, so there's some fraud, I use the example right. of Second Life, the, right. the virtual world, there's some fraud takes place in Second Life, and somebody comes to the district court here in uh, Washington, D.C., and says, give me a remedy against this fraudulent actor. And the court says, well, you know, Second Life has a system for dealing with this, and it's reasonable, and it reflects the views of the people who are interacting in Second Life. So maybe if they've already had an adjudication about this and decided mm -hmm. you're in the wrong, we're not going to step in. And, and once they do that, that becomes sort of a, a triggering event for a sort of serious law to develop in these communities. What um, is the uh, state of freedom and liberty in cyberspace? Is it still growing, or is some uh, critics worry that it's being fettered by commercial interests or state interests? I think it's worrisome. I, I'm, I'm glad critics are worried about the state of freedom uh, on cyberspace. I think both the, the commercial interests are uh, troublingly concentrated in terms mm -hmm. of the, the basic infrastructure of the net, I think has become controlled by a small number of, of entities, and that's always and been it, to and Jeffersonians. And running the range from Comcast, a cable company, to Google, or whoever, right? Correct, I mean, yeah, yeah. Running, running that narrow right. range right. Uh, yeah. of, of people who have their hands on the levers of, of indispensable resources for internet communication. That's what, troublesome. What is going to be the big uh, cyberspace-related issue in the Obama, for the Obama administration? I mean, I think it's net neutrality. Um, quite honestly, I, I, don't, I, I go both ways on the net neutrality issue. Um, net neutrality meaning uh, a, a, a rule that would um, prohibit service providers from discriminating amongst different messages that are coming across, right. so putting some in high quality uh, messages, low quality, putting them in different Isn't that queues. something that the market would sort out, though, where you would either, if you're like truncating other people's messages, nobody would use you, well, no. or they would be willing to pay for that? Well, that's right. I mean, and people may be, people almost certainly are willing to pay, for example, for, for network services that give you a greater quality of service guarantee than the internet now does. Um, nothing wrong with that. Um, the problem is that the, if you start crowding up the network machines with doing a lot of work, the thing that makes the net so extraordinary is that it's a dumb network. It's right. the stupidest network imaginable. It just moves bits around. It lets all the processing take place at the end point, the right. users. Um, once you start making those network machines discriminate, that's additional processing. You've got to check what queue is it in, who's got it, et cetera. Um, possible problem. Okay. We are going to end it there. David Post, right. thank you so much for coming thank in. Thank you, Nick. I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and we've been talking with David Post of Temple University Law School and the author of Jefferson's Moose, Notes on the State of Cyberspace. <laughs>